Okay, again, good morning. Welcome to the annual 2023 Tennessee Prescribed Fire Council meeting. Uh, we have a great lineup today, but I'd uh, first like to go over some housekeeping rules. Those of you who are in-house, at the back of the table is a check-in sheet. Please make sure before lunch that you go back in the, and sign in there. If your name is not on the sheet, on the second page of the sheet, um, if you just flip it over, please uh, write in your information there. Those of you who are not Tennessee certified burn managers or do not know your uh, burn number, that's okay, that's all right. Um, we do have, for just for your information, you can go to our website, uh, tnpfc.org, and there is a list of certified uh, Tennessee prescribed burn managers on that website, and your number will be on there had you ever taken the Tennessee prescribed burn certified burn manager course. Um, agendas are also on the table back there. I usually don't do paper uh, because we live in, in such a virtual electronic world now. However, uh, I do find it helpful as we're going through the day when I forget to put the agenda up on the screen, you all know what's happening and have information. There are also multiple bathrooms here in the building. There are two in the back on the first floor, and then on the second floor to the left is the women's bathrooms, and to the right is the men's bathrooms. We will be having lunch today, um, and that is going to be catered by Moe's sometime around 1145 or noon, depending on how many questions and conversation. It's an hour-long lunch at least, so I do expect some chit-chatting and networking um, and collaboration and cooperation between agencies uh, and, and private industry as well as nonprofits. And please introduce yourself to me because I've emailed a lot of you um, and may not recognize your face. Uh, finally, um, we'll go through the agenda um, just shortly. Those of you who are in-house, again, you can look at the agenda. Those of you who are virtual, you when you registered, there is a event website that has the agenda on there, as well as bios of all of our speakers today. Uh, in the virtual realm, your participants, your video and microphones have been turned off, and that's uh, due to uh, kind of going through the meeting, having the speakers be uninterrupted. However, your questions and comments are really important to us, so please facilitate using the chat box that you'll find in Microsoft Teams. Uh, in that chat box, we will have Tim Phelps here in-house uh, and then also in the virtual realm who will be monitoring that chat and will provide us for when we need to ask your questions. So I welcome questions and comments in the virtual realm. Also, we have one virtual presenter today. This is for the virtual world and for the in-house world, which thankfully, because of what we had to go through with COVID, it's going to be pretty smooth to see everyone's PowerPoints in-house and virtual. Uh, so please have um, uh, please have no concern there. Those of you in the virtual realm, if you're seeing something that's kind of technical and tricky, again, facilitate that chat box. We'll try to help you out as much as we can. However, we are IT people. So um, if it is a problem or an issue that you're facing on your end, I'm not sure how much we can help you. That being said, I would like to go ahead and introduce Wade Waters, who is the current chair of the Tennessee Prescribed Fire Council. Wade is also the TDF Assistant State Forester of Fire and Emergency Operations. Wade, would you like to come up for some opening remarks? Thank you, Jackie. Uh, welcome to those in the room. Welcome to those online. Really appreciate your time. Um, and I'd just like to start off by recognizing Jackie Broker's efforts in putting this all together. You can see she's um, she's put together a great list of presenters. I think it's going to be a really good educational day um, and really looking forward to a lot of good discussions, questions and answers. But Jackie um, almost single handedly pulled all this together um, and really just want to recognize her for her efforts in uh, in that. Um, yeah, round of applause. I mean, from the from the caterer to reaching out to presenters, you know, herding herding cats, whatever 
whatever was needed, uh, she pulled it all together, getting in, you know, trying to figure out CEUs. And I mean, the list went on and on. Uh, for those of you that may not know, the website went down for a while. She's ferreting that out. Um, so big thanks to big thanks to Jackie um, and looking forward to a great day. Um, you know, we've we've done a lot over the last year, over the last few years in ramping up um, implementation of prescribed fire in Tennessee, um, as well as some of our, our partner states around the region. Um, and there's been a lot of good work done. I think this this meeting today will help us um, both from a networking perspective, uh, collaboration perspective, but also an educational perspective, continue to take steps forward in uh, responsibly getting prescribed fire uh, put on the landscape across Tennessee. And so really looking forward to the day and I'll step out of the way and turn the floor back over to Jackie. Thank you, Wade. And um, I couldn't have done this without delegating some of the tasks to you all out there. Craig Harver helped me out a lot with figuring out the uh, agenda and suggesting um, some speakers. Jason O'Shell has been voluntold to help me with the catering as well as Clint today. Um, and a, a whole lot of handful. Alex, who works with TNC, has done a great job uh, trying to figure out the the uh, website. So we could not do this without the community, right? So if you feel you'd like to get involved with the Tennessee Prescribed Fire Council, I encourage you to do that. And I will find something for you to do um, if, if you really would like. So now I'd like to turn it over to our state forester, who is David Arnold. We, he could not be with us today because he is on a tour uh, in Sevier County. Um, and basically, he's trying to show the powers that be what we do in the fire realm. Um, but however, he did record a short video, so we're going to uh, take a look at that. Good day, everybody. For those that don't know me, I am David Arnold, Tennessee State Forester, and I wish I could be providing these welcoming comments to you today in person, but I'm actually in Sevier County reviewing some burned areas from recent fires we had there. And what I wanted to speak to today is my excitement about this Tennessee Prescribed Fire Council, what y'all bring to the table and bringing a professional ethic to the prescribed fire program in Tennessee and your leadership role in bringing that prof professional ethic about. And whenever I think about what constitutes a professional prescribed fire program, I think of three areas. The first and foremost and most visible from my perspective is safety. Whenever we're conducting these, these prescribed burns, we must have safety as our top priority and it's very visible wh whether or not we're being professional in those endeavors. Anytime I see a picture or a short video about one of our burns on the landscape, one of the first things I look at are the personnel on that burn wearing the required PPE. And you'll know in a hurry whether or not that's the case and whether or not that's happening. So an indicator of a professional program to me, most fundamental and foremost, are we being safe in implementing that program? The second indicator of a professional fire program to me are, are the partners using fire science to help drive decisions. Are burn plans being put in place that have the correct information to help drive that decision, identify resources, again, people safe, keep, keep people safe. So rely on and use fire science to help drive those on the ground decisions. And then the third element or foundation for a pres professional prescribed fire program from my perspective, it's easy to get excited about those situations where you have made the decision to burn, but are we making wise decisions on when not to burn, whether from a from a technical standpoint, a weather standpoint, terrain standpoint? If we say no, that's a good thing. Or the resource standpoint, there are some forest conditions, especially out there, where it just does not make sense to burn at all. And then also, we're running into some situations through our cost share programs that if we're not careful, we're committing landowners to spend money and commit to a cost share contract where it absolutely does not make sense to burn. Where it's due to smoke management, the timing of the year, 
or the size of the burn. So just a quick review, safety, use fire science, and then are we saying no at the appropriate times? So to me, those are the fundamental foundations of professional prescribed fire program. Again, wish I was with you there in person, but regardless, I know this is going to be a great meeting. Enjoy the day, learn from each other, and be safe. All right, so that was David Arnold, our state uh, forester for the Tennessee Division of Forestry. Um, thank you, David, for those wonderful comments. I neglected to introduce myself to those of you, uh, and I apologize for that. My name is Jackie Broker. I am the current secretary Te treasurer for the Tennessee Prescribed Fire Council. I am also, uh, my, my job is uh, strike team coordinator for the Tennessee Division of Forestry. What that means is I have two focused teams that travel the state. One works on uh, hemlocks, conservation of eastern hemlocks that are facing extinction due to a non-native invasive species. But I also have a prescribed fire crew, a strike team, and we have the ability to travel the state assisting with, with uh, conducting prescribed burns, uh, as well as anything else that relates to getting those burns done. In the summertime, uh, I am really happy to say that now I have the capability and abilities and freedom to take a 20 person type 2IA crew out on Western fire assignments. Um, and my crew at that point gets either put on my crew uh, and has to continue to follow me around the nation um, and or they can go out on single resource assignments and or engines and things like that. So I apologize that I didn't introduce myself earlier. Those of you who will be speaking today and presenting today, although I have your presentation information on the virtual realm, um, it I would appreciate that you all introduce yourself, say a few things about who you are and how it relates to prescribed fire. Now I'd like to bring up Robin Bible. Um, he is a fire management specialist for the Tennessee Division of Forestry, and he's going to give us our um, safety message today. Thanks, Robin. Good morning, everybody. It's really great to see all of you in person after such a long period of virtual meetings and, and getting together. So I, I really appreciate all of you. Uh, taking time to be here this morning. Uh, some of you probably know um, I'm kind of the administrator of our Tennessee Certified Burn Manager Program. And again, I've been maintaining that. We just wrapped up our spring workshop. Uh, again, it was virtual, but we're looking hopefully this fall to get back to an in-person uh, meeting. So again, those dates are going to be October 16th and 18th. So wanna, if you've got folks that would like to get certified as a, a burn manager, you know, let me know. But as you heard David say, one of the most important things that we do in burning is, is safety. And, you know, those of us that are wildland firefighters know about the 10 and 18, the 18 watch out situations, the 10 standard fire orders. Well, I did a little bit of digging, and this is from uh, Jonathan Sutton over at NC State University. He came up with the, uh, 10 standard prescribed fire safety orders. So I just want to go through those with you real briefly here. Safety begins with preparation. That's number one. Having a well thought out and well communicated safety plan is crucial to maintain an atmosphere of safety. Number two, plan and establish LCES. Anybody, everybody know what LCES is? Lookouts, communication, escape routes and safety zones. That's one of the, well, the first things that most of our wildland firefighters learn when they, they get out on the line, making sure that you have good lookouts, making sure that your communication plan is in place and your communication equipment is functional. Ensuring that you have escape routes because you may need escape routes just like you would on a wildfire. You need to know need to know where to go to be safe and those safety zones where you can go and be safe. Number three is do a walkthrough. Before starting the burn, do a complete walkthrough with your crew to make sure that you know everything on the ground. Be sure to visually locate then where your safety zones are going to be, where your escape routes are going to be, where any crucial points are going to be. 
Preseason training, number four. During the offseason, be sure to conduct regular training exercises that will keep crew members prepared to handle adverse situations. And I'll add to that, make sure that uh, you maintain your fitness standard because you need to be fit and, and be able to be capable to carry out a prescribed burn just like you would be to, to fight a wildfire. Personal protective equipment checklist. You know, the day before your burn, it's not the time to get your your gear out and look at it and, and you know, you may be missing something. And uh, it's a good idea to have a checklist that you can go through and you can do that and inspect your PPE. That's number seven. Make sure that it's all ready to go. Make sure there's not any cracks or rips in your fire retarding clothing and so forth. Number eight, inspect your tools and equipment. Inspect hand tools and power tools for rust, cracks, chips, or any type of wear that may make the tool unsafe before your use. Also inspect and maintain your equipment on a routine basis. Number nine, make sure you do the go, no go checklist. And all of you that have been through certified burn manager training know about the go, no go checklist, about having a checklist of items that are going to tell you whether or not you're going to be able to actually burn or not. You know, again, knowing about appropriate weather, suitable weather conditions, making sure everything is there, making sure you've got your burn permit, everything that goes into place there. And finally, number 10, avoid complacency. Do not let successful burns cause you to become complacent. Throughout the duration of the burn, maintain a heightened sense of awareness at all times. Know your surroundings. Be conscious of any dead trees, limbs, safety hazards out there, and be very aware of that. No matter how many times you burn, it just takes one burn to get you or your crew members injured. And finally, you all know this, never burn alone. Never be out there by yourself conducting a burn. That's the 10 standard prescribed fire orders. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, Robin. Um, as we all know, it's really important when we're dealing with wildland fire, any fire for that <laughs> in that matter, but uh, to make sure that we're safe. And that's go that's every day, all day long, not just in the fire realm, but also in our um, in our lives. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Robin. I forgot to mention that there are CEUs offered today. Um, at the end of the meeting today, I will post a QR code for those of you in-house and also online if you would like to get CEUs. And it's three and a half CEUs, I believe in category one. Uh, also, Robin mentioned that there is going to be a certified burn manager course in October 17th, I believe, Robin, 17th through the 19th. So uh, those of you who maybe don't have your certified uh, Tennessee certified burn manager certification, uh, that will be another opportunity. If you have questions about that, you can reach out to Robin Bible. You can find his information on the Tennessee Division of Forestry website. At this time, I'd like to invite you all to uh, for a break. Uh, we're going to get set up for our first speaker, Mike Saunders, who is scheduled for 930, which gives us a little over 10 minutes for a break. During this break, please feel free to introduce yourselves to other people in the room as we're all here together to talk about certified or to talk about prescribed fire in Tennessee. So let's come back a little before uh, 930 as that's when our first speaker is going to be. Um... All right, so uh, it is uh, 929 if everybody will take their seats. Um, being a great facilitator means that you try to herd cats. And so not saying that you guys are cats, uh, but I do try to do my best as far as facilitating um, today. Uh, for our next speaker, we have invited Mike Saunders, who's an associate professor of civiculture for the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources for Purdue University. Um, Mike is going to talk to us today about prescribed fire causes wounding and minor tree quality degradation in oak forest. Mike, if you would take just a minute to introduce yourself a little bit more, and I will um, give you the uh, stand. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me here today. Um, Mike Saunders, I uh, 
here at Purdue, been here at Purdue for since 2008, I believe, 2007, actually. Um, I'm a member of the Hardwood Tree Improvement and Regeneration Center, one of the scientists in that group, and then I'm also the the lead PI on the Hardwood Ecosystem Experiment, which is a large scale test of different civil cultural systems um, at sites in southern Indiana. Uh, this this work was um, this talk here is basically the same talk I've given to actually a number of prescribed fire councils in the eastern U.S. Um, and it, it's a compilation of about six years of work uh, looking at the effects of prescribed fire on um, our forest, um, particularly kind of into the context of how we can use prescribed fire uh, to build oak regeneration in our forest. Um, one of the things I've learned over the number of numerous years and a lot of talks is if you don't acknowledge the people that help you up front of the talk, uh, you rarely have time to, you always run out of time at the end to give them adequate thanks. So I would like to do that. Um, I would like to thank uh, this work that I'll be talking about today is basically the theses of three graduate students, Shannon Stannis, David Mann, and Sarah Cooperidge. And then I had three U.S. Forest Service Northern Research Station collaborators, Jan Wiedenbach, Dan Day, and Thomas Schuler, who all helped significantly in get, uh, securing funding and, and helping securing sites for the for all this work. I have to thank uh, ton of individual forest managers, uh, loggers, um, truckers, sawmills, uh, students, staff. There was this was probably a compilation. There's probably about 100 people to thank for all of the work that went into this research. Um, so. If they're out there, I hope they hear the thanks. Um, so just a little background. This this talk's going to be a little broader than just timber damage. Uh, and largely because I need to put it in context. Um, as we're all aware in this room, likely that, you know, oak ecosystems are really important components of the forest land in the eastern U.S. They comprise a large percentage of the forest land. They sequester 3.2 billion tons of carbon by some estimates. Um, and they represent uh, over 130 billion cubic feet of, of timber volume and and one time with a back of the envelope calculation I did over a couple beers with some friends, we calculated that to be over a trillion dollars in stumpage value. Um, they're the most important source of food for birds and mammals in the eastern U.S. Over 100 species or over 200 species of vertebrates depend on oak, eastern oak systems at some component of their life stage. Um, and they support a higher level of biodiversity than most other forest types in the east, um, including the maple beech that successfully replaced them. Um, this is largely because of their relatively sparse canopy structure that allows a lot of light penetration to get to the ground floor. And if there's no strong mid-story component, you have a really diverse uh, species rich uh, understory. Uh, that often that means there's that many more insect insect species and that just cascades down the food chub web in terms of the amount of, of biodiversity we see in a maple beech forest we don't get that because it's such high shade uh, we often don't have a strong understory development in, in a maple beech forest um, and we have to recognize the economic driver that the oak forest is not only in terms of timber but recreation I mean 150, 200 million people probably live within two hours of an oak forest. Um, and many of those individuals will use that forest for their destination or camping, fishing, hiking, bird watching, you name it. Um, so it's an important driver of our eastern, of our, of our economy in the eastern U.S. And John Locke at the University of Kentucky compiled this for me, looking at the, the age and size class distribution of the eastern oak hickory forest and you can see um, this big ball just big um, peak in distribution uh, from age class 40 through age class uh, about 100 
Um, this means we have a lot of saw timber in these stands. And we don't have a lot of small stands, um, younger stands, to, to replace these older stands as we harvest those stands um, or as those stands um, mature into old, older A class. We'd like to see this much more level. So we know that there's this age imbalance in our eastern oak forest. In these aging forests, we obviously will change in composition. This is some data I took at the hardwood ecosystem experiment in 2008 and 2009, just prior to our initial harvest. And oh, about 70% of the overstory in these stands was oak and hickory. 13% of the midstory of the trees that were basically next in line to replace the overstory were oak. Over half of them were maple beech. So this is not an uncommon um, story. We see this throughout the Eastern Oak Forest, and it's because of this lack of fire. This lack of the, the importance of fire in the Eastern Oak Forest is, was always underrated, and as now, you know, we, we're trying to ramp up the fire we see in the Eastern Oak Forest to, to combat this term called mestification, where by allowing this, this maple beech to develop, we're actually making these forests more resistant to, to fire. Um, I'm not a big fan of the mesification term. I like the, I like to be a little bit more direct and call it mapleization. Um, that the forest is just becoming a maple sea, um, but uh, mesification seems to have caught up, caught on in the literature a little bit better. Excuse me. And part of this, I I feel at least on my music sites and my experience in Indiana was this by many foresters, this harvest and hope mentality. We harvest when we think oak is massing or small seedlings are present. So we have, we have, we, we, we harvest it, we see the oak on the ground, we're saying, oh, we're in good shape. And we hope that enough, enough of those oaks survive through 15 to 20 years of intense composition, competition to be released in thinning. And this picture here is a perfect example. There was a lot of oak, this was clear cut. There was a ton of oak around, probably all about waist high. On this music site, those maple, um, those oak got swamped by competitors. If you look carefully, you can find a few red oak that kind of have their tops about two thirds of the way up through this sea of, of tulip powder and sweet gum and you name it, um, but they'll never survive another 15 to 20 years. Uh, so this seldom works, especially on our more music sites. Uh, and this is this is because we've lost for a while there we really lost touch with how fire and oak are interrelated. And um, Mary Arthur, Dan Day, and others wrote this really nice paper in Journal of Forestry showing how you need to use fire as various components of the regeneration process to to build um, oak back into that forest to maintain oak in that system. You need it for thinning the overstory density so that you have the right light conditions, creating the right fuel bed and mineral soil exposure for the oak to regenerate, and then periodically purging the or reducing the amount of competitors in the understory, ones that um, can't tolerate repeated top kills from fire. So yeah, I, I I was asked I asked myself, well, why did we lose touch of oak? We know that oak's going to take multiple disturbances. Why did we lose touch? And it comes down to perceptions. Um, this work really started. I really started investigating this when one of the my former grad students took a job um, in Ohio, and I asked them how they were if they were using fire over there much, and he said no, they're too worried about timber damage. And I'm going, well, if we do fire in the right way, we can moderate the intensity. We can moderate how we do fire so that we're not getting a lot of damage to overstory stems. But that's not what the perception was from that from his supervisor. And it's not the perception that we see from log, um, from some loggers, timber buyers, even mill owners. They all have this great fear that we're going to have this if we bring fire back into these systems, excuse me, we're going to see charred stems and cat faces all over. This is a picture from actually a, 
a Missouri Ozark site that is being managed more for woodland structure, not timber timber production. But this is the perception they have of bringing fire back into these systems. And I just I knew that wasn't the case. But when you look through the literature, there's not a lot of stuff. There's not a lot of information on how fire actually um, impacts overstory or mature timber. So we know, or silviculturally, we know that oak is really adapted to surviving multiple disturbances. It, the fire ecology oak is full periods, multiple of applications of fire are probably going to be needed to get oak to the overstory. Doing a single harvest alone won't do it. So when we're looking at our really our mesic sites in Indiana, we have two options. We can use fire to promote natural regeneration to try to match the dis to the disturbance ecology of the species. And we have a ton of research showing that this works. Pat Rose, he's made his career on showing how you can use prescribed fire um, in Apple Allegheny hardwoods to get back oak. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of research in different parts of the country to show that happened. But it, the research just hadn't gotten to the ground, and I think part of it was for that perception. Um, and where I was con what I was hearing in Indiana was, well, we'll just go out, go ahead and just plant everything. We'll go out and underplant, and we'll bring the oak back by then. Then I don't have to worry about the timber damage. Well, surprisingly, there's really little... Um, to be honest, there's not a lot of information on how white oak responds in an underplanting environment, in, at least in the research, um, in the primary literature. Uh, there might have been a lot of management studies, but it's it's not known really if white oaks, what type of cultural regimes you need to use for white oaks in these type of situations. So the other, for, for either of those alternatives, they could be a costly ende endeavor. I mean, with alternative A, we're using fire to promote natural regeneration. We got fire supplies, the labor, the red tape, the logistics, and then this big question mark, which we really didn't know and which I wanted to tackle, significant timber damage. And then for alternative B, we have all the seedlings, the labor, the competition control, the herbivore control, et cetera. At least on our sites, we can't get away without not using some type of deer fencing. Um, so there's definitely an economic balance in terms of the use of RX fire for regeneration. On the cost side, we actually have this unknown and what's the actual damage to overstory dim timber that we could receive with multiple applications of prescribed fire. And that's gonna both be enumerated both in terms of stumpage or it could be in, re in uh, uh, at the final product stage of reduced lumber values. And then, for the same applications of the number of fire, how many oaks are we going to get when we when we use fire? And correspondingly, what would it cost to create that many oaks through alternative B, through an artificial regeneration approach of planting with all the associated cost cost of that situation? And, you know, I recognize that this balance will likely change with the fire regime, the location, market variables, topographic variables. So it's a pretty complex problem. And I'm just kind of starting to get onto these economic side of this equation. So today I'm going to highlight this is kind of the research objectives I've done over the last six years. Um, I'm going to highlight three of these. Um, there are two of these in particular, number one and number three. Uh, number two, I'll give you a, kind of some early results on. Um, I'm kind of, um, trying to find a, a, a postdoc actually that will help me finish up number two and number four. So if any of you in the audience are interested in getting a postdoc in fire ecology and oak, I'd be happy to talk to you. So our study sites, um, this is all part of a joint fire science project that ended up a couple years ago. Um, they're in, uh, this was in the Hoosier National Forest, the Wayne National Forest, Mark Twain National Forest, and Daniel Boone National Forest. So for the timber damage study, we, we looked at 139 stands selected across these four national forests. 
and the stands had to be oak dominated. They had to have site indexes greater than 60 feet uh, on a 50 year basis. And the reason why we wanted stands that were being used for would be considered for timber production purposes, not stands that were being restored to like an open wood wood lot uh, woodland type situation, a savanna, barren habitat restoration. We wanted stands that were were um, where the goal of the fire would be to regenerate oak. Uh, no known wildfire as far as we could tell. And then we wanted the prescribed fire to have been started between some type of prescribed fire regime that had started between five and 25 years ago. So hopefully multiple applications of prescribed fire um, in, in a range of conditions. And in the end, we ended up having sites that uh, had between one and six burns across these these four national forests with half on Zurich and half on music aspects. We also selected several um, stands that matched in composition and site quality and aspect that we knew had no history of prescribed fire, or at least no management records of prescribed fire, uh, so that we could look at the uh, kind of a baseline of what, what the background level of damage was in these forests. We inventoried each stand, uh, measured all the fire caused wounds on each tree, um, and then estimated what the tree grade, the US Forest Service tree grade was for each individual tree, both considering any fire damage and ignoring that fire damage. So we could kind of see what the impact of the damage was itself on grade. And then we could estimate stumpage volume and value for each tree, both with and without fire damage. So we had our various wound types, cat faces. We had bark slough that we would categorize in terms of, of some type of dead, underlying dead uh, area in the vascular cambium where the bark hadn't come out, come off yet. Seams where heat might have caused cracks in that tree. Flutes and multiple seams, more complex um, breakages in the in the cambium layers, and then ovals uh, where we often would see suspended dead wood lying up against the tree that probably caught fire during a prescribed burn. We measured over 8,000 trees. Um, again, these were oak dominant, heavily oak dominated sites because we're trying to estimate what was, you know, again, we're trying to come at it from the perspective of using fire to regenerate oak. So got to have oak in the overstory if we want to regenerate oak on the ground. Um, so 44% of the trees were white oak, 16 red oak, 8 hickory, and then you can kind of see the breakdown here. This gives you a background of the number of trees that were wounded out of these populations of sample trees. Um, on average, 20 to 40% of the trees had been wounded. Um, and then this is the background rate of wounding. So if we didn't have fire, we saw anywhere between 7 or, th well, tulip poplar 3%, but Three to seventeen percent of the trees, sixteen percent of the trees were were wounded. So I'm going to summarize a lot of this research and just kind of some take homes. Um, so take home number one, we saw that absolute volume and value losses due to prescribed fire damage was actually quite low. Um, a lot, and if you want to look more into this work, um, there's a couple articles I have. One's in the uh, for science and one is in Journal of Forestry that summarizes a lot of this data. The absolute butt log volume loss was about 200 board feet per acre um, due to fire, but you saw we had a very high range. There's a lot of zeros. There's a lot of sites we saw absolutely in a lot of plots. We saw absolutely no damage from prescribed fire, and there were a few cases where we had you know, a, a long history of prescribed fire where we saw full trees that had basically um, could be, were called just because of repeated wounding from prescribed fire. But in terms of stumpage value loss, this in the in essence is a lot of those, those call trees were actually low quality trees to start with. So they didn't add a lot of value to these stands. Um, so we had anywhere from zero dollar value loss, stumpage value loss, up to two hundred seventy-three dollars per acre volume loss. Um, 
So in all these cases, Stan's received at least one burn, sometimes many more. Our second take home, uh, the more prescribed fire you have, the increase in relative volume loss. So a percent of the total volume from the stand, we had up to about 12% on our south facing slopes uh, in when we had four or more fires. Um, aspect here, it, there's a trend for more damage on south facing slopes, but it's not significant and it doesn't really become pronounced until you get three or more burns. But these are still relatively low. I mean, for the most part, a good proportion of the stands, three or less burns, 4% or less of the relative volume is lost. Um, you get to four, five, six burns, you'll start to see that creep up to eight to 10% at times. We saw wounding increasing with more prescribed fire. Um, so we see this big trend with the red line here that wounding does increase over with, when you have um, multiple burns, uh, increasing kind of the background rate is about 10% of a wound of trees are wounded. But by the time you get up to, these are all about the same. It's about 40% when you get to three and three or more burns on average. Um, but the grade reduction uh, stays relatively, is relatively resistant. Um, it isn't, um, we had some really, five and six burns here were mostly from the Ozarks. Uh, they stayed relatively low. So only about uh, 20 to 30% of the trees uh, typically saw a grade reduction um, across most of our sites. And this grade reduction and this wounding care cap capabilities really differed strongly by species. Um, this first column shows, in terms of our sample, the likelihood that a tree will receive a wound. Uh, shortleaf pine, kind of the champion here, did not receive a wound uh, very often. And this is with one or more burns. Tulip poplar was actually pretty low. And the reason being is most of the tulip poplar we found in these sites were very large. So the tulip poplar, when they get very large, they have thick bark and they can resist quite a bit of a fire. Um, all the young tulip poplar from these stands probably had already succumbed from to fire uh, and weren't there. Um, but if you look at the white oaks are relatively a little bit lower in wounding percentage compared to red oaks, um, which were in the red oak, the red oaks were roughly com comparable with the maples and beeches. Where you see some differences though is grade reduction. And the grade reduction here is conditional on wounding. So it's saying basically of my 25% of, you know, 25% of my oaks, white oaks, will get wounded from a fire. Of those 25%, 13.5% will see a grade reduction. So if you wanna look at the entire population, you just have to multiply those two. That says, essentially says three to 4% of white oaks overall will see any kind of grade reduction from prescribed fire. And again, this is often related, it's a little, it has to do a little bit with the species characteristics, like post oak is in the Ozarks, receives more damage, but white oak, chestnut oak, both are relatively resistant to fire and they compartmentalize their wounds fairly rapidly as compared to some of the red oaks. So this is this is some pretty interesting information and, and great for kind of determining kind of what the likelihood of, of some damage is on a, on a particular site. <clears throat> All right, so the second part of this work was really looking at kind of the lumber, rec lumber recovery. So we know on the ground what it looks like. So what does that mean actually when we get to the mill? Because there could be a lot of damage that could be hidden within the logs that we're not just aware of. So we had 145 trees that we um, felled from the Hoosier, Wayne, and Mark Twain National Forest, and we harvested these, um, taking the logs to a mill, um, 
and basically sawing these up to see what type of damage we saw actually in the lumber. And this was a pretty complicated process. I mean, a lot of different color paints. I think I have 15 different colors of, of tree paint now um, so that we could track, we could paint the ends of the logs a certain color and track that log all the way through the mill. So we milled these all into six quarter material. We measured the dimensions and so we knew how much volume there was and then looked at the NHL grade of each board. And then we could do the similar thing here as we did in this for standing timber. Do the volume and uh, figure out the dimensions in NLHA grade, both assuming there's fire damage and ignoring that fire damage. So that gives us an indication of how much of the lumber value and volume had been lost due to prescribed fire damage. So I, we don't have all this data worked up yet, um, but we have 44 logs that we did for the Hoosier National Forest. This resulted in 648 boards and only 97 of those boards were fire damaged. Most of them was a reduction in grade, a few a reduction. I mean, most of it was a reduction in volume where you lost a few board feet at the end of one log, um, but it was only in total across all of all 97 logs. We only lost 211 board feet. Um, so it wasn't much. It was one or two board feet per log uh, per per board. Uh, 27 of them lost grade. That was usually because of some type of stain. Uh, in total across that sample, only three and a half percent of the volume was lost, 44 percent of the value. So now that we've looked at the cost side of the equation, I also wanted to look at the regeneration side of the equation. And here we used 47 burn, burn sites and 16 control sites in the Hoosier and Mark Twain National or Hoosier National Forest and Wayne National Forest. Wanted to do this on more sites, but this is when COVID hit and uh, our field sampling got curtailed. Um, we inventoried the regeneration and mid story at all the sample points that was used in the timber damage study on these sites. And then looked and analyzed the composition and abundance of the mid story and regeneration to the number of prescribed fires in the time since the last prescribed fire. So some take homes here. Uh, the more prescribed fire we have, the more seed, the more larger seedlings we have. So when we see this line go up. There's a lot of play in this line, but we see a trend for the there to be more. If we burn more often, we get larger seedlings, um, and we get a trend for more uh, for more um, for more seedlings overall. Uh, the more times we have prescribed fire, the larger the proportion of oak in the stand. Now, remember, these sites were heavy to oak to start with, so there was a lot of oak regeneration present in the understory. Um, what? So, so this looks doesn't look that impressive, but I want you to look this black bar on the right side of each one of these triplets is the maple and beech. So we're going from a 10% of the ceilings on maple and beech down to nearly zero. Okay, so we see this trend. The more often we use fire, we're driving down the maple and beech competition. That's what we're hope. That's what we always hope in oak hickory uh, when we're using fire and these uh, to regenerate oak. Interestingly, though, if um, we started looking at the time, like the return interval, if we and basically, if you waited more than four years after a burn, so you you burn it and then you walk away and you don't come back five, six, seven, eight years later, we see this rebound, and this is again the left or the right bar in this triplet, we see a rebound in Maple and Beach. Okay, so if you burn it and just leave and think one application is going to do it, probably not. You got to keep burning it until you're ready to regenerate. Um, otherwise, you've lost all ground that you started with. And many of those regeneration patterns are driven by the impacts of the fire on the mid story. So it took a couple burns 
Um, one burn, if you have one burn, it knocks it down just a little bit in terms of the mid story, the density. Two and three burns kind of does another number, but it isn't until you get after three burns that you really are starting to push um, and drive the mid story down. OK, so it takes four burns to really have that significant impact on reducing mid story. All right, bring this all together. When I'm thinking of telling my students and my uh, and uh, foresters I work with on what how, how to use prescribed fire in these stands, at least on these music sites, I tell them to target a two to three foot flame length. Um, this is based on some other data observations, lots of talks with foresters and when they've seen damage, seems two to three foot is is a good flame length to get some good mid story kill, at least smaller mid story trees, but um, but also consume most consume enough of the duff and litter layers in, in these areas to get good uh, seed bed conditions for germination of oak. Prescribed fire has minimal impact on residual timber values until four plus fires are used. Um, but conversely, oak regeneration probably needs four plus fires to respond if you're only using prescribed fire alone. So there's a little bit of a problem here because there's a little overlap here. If we use fire, if we use fire four times, at least my regenerate my data is showing that you could start to see some pretty significant impacts in regen on on timber values, uh, enough that it's going to be noticeable. Um, that that you know you're going to get up into six, seven, eight percent. It'll start. It start could start to be noticeable that you're losing that much rel of volume in your stand. Um, but the regeneration is probably going to need that much. If you're trying, if you have a strong mid-story component, you're probably going to need four fires to get rid of that mid-story component. So I've really been starting to promote the idea that you have to do mid-story removal in conjunction with prescribed fire to to be successful. Um, large mid-story trees are going to take multiple applications of fire to really to to get them to die and um, and and fall out of the stand. So it might be better if you have a stronger, larger mid-story component to actually use a mechanical process, go out and do some chainsaw work, mid-story removal, a formal mid-story removal, um, and then use fire to, to more condition the seed bed um, and get the, the seed bed in the right con condition. So I think it's more, it can be a more of a two-step process and you, you have to be consider using mid-story removal to, to, to help, help the fire do its job. Let's put it that way. So that's kind of all I had to say, and I'm I'm happy to open it up to questions and discussion at this time. Okay, thank you so much, Mike. We'll go ahead and open this up for questions. Looks like we have one in the chat. Ben Myers, who own, who is part of Panther Creek Forestry, is wondering if he can get a copy of the PowerPoint. Sure. I can. Um, you want me to send that to you? Yeah, that would be great if you'll just send that to me, and then I can. Those of you who are interested, just uh, shoot me an email. Everybody here today should have my email. No problem, Ben. Any questions in the room? I do have a microphone. Hang on a second, Mike. I'm going to walk around. Good morning. I've got a question. It's on. Sure. Yep. About uh, alternative A versus alternative B. And your presentation focused on um, alternative A. So I don't know if there's been a cost comparison between the two approaches when you take in oak regeneration as a consideration you know it's not just uh the the deer fencing the herbicide you know you're looking at the bigger picture of both together um if there's a benefit of saying okay prescribed fire is better for management and and long-term economic benefits as well yeah just a minute well i haven't done it I've done some back the envelope calculations and I actually have that ready. I can show you a little bit of this. 
Um, let me bring it up. So this is my back of the envelope calculations, and this is why I want a postdoc is to kind of like refine this a little bit. But um, and I put my warning, unrealistic assumptions and estimates are ahead. Um, <laughs> So alternative A, three or four burns for natural regeneration. This is my goal um, to create 250 trees per acre of competitive oak by year 15. So these were my estimates, cost per acre of 150 to $200 per acre to do the burns, mid-story removal, uh, overstory damage, hopefully $150 or less. So we're hoping 700 to $1,100 per acre. Now you can disagree with my numbers, but that's kind of where I had put it. And then alternative B, the same thing, 250 trees per acre. I have herbivore. I have to put deer fence up. Um, one oat stock, tree tubes or, or fencing, take your pick. Planting and tubing labor, herbicide, tube maintenance, um, I was estimating anywhere from thousand to fifteen hundred fifty dollars an acre. All right, Mike, we have uh, some questions in the chat, so I'll do one question in the chat and then we'll go back to the room. Uh, first question is from Deborah. I have always heard post oaks were more fire tolerant than white oaks. And that is why post oaks are indicator species for savannas and woodlands. Can you talk a little bit more about this? So in my study, I saw post oaks. The post oaks we saw were mostly over in the Ozarks. Um, so that most of my sample that where we looked at um, prescribed fire, uh, and all my observations were in the Ozarks. So they received, in general, in the a lot of my study was driven by the intensity of fire that they used in the Ozarks was a lot higher. So I, I saw a lot higher damage in some of my post oaks than I did in my other oaks. Um, and I think it's just because in the Ozarks they were, the Ozarks, they're not worried so much about getting oak. What they're using fire for in the Ozarks is to try to get short leaf pine. So they burn it a little bit higher intensity. Therefore, you see a little bit more fire, fire damage. And that's where I saw most of my really high fire damage was in the in the Ozarks. Um, but yeah, you're right. Around uh, in in the in our eastern forests, like the Hoosier, the Mark Twain, uh, the Daniel Boone, probably I didn't do measure a lot of post oaks because those sites would have been a low enough quality that, uh, and probably where we manage for barrens, for um, uh, savannas, uh, open glades, stuff like that, that I wouldn't have seen them in my sample. So most of my post oaks, post oaks came from the Ozarks. Great. So we'll move on to a question in the room. Hey, Mike, this is Clint Borum with Tennessee Wildlife. I noticed what I was, I, I think you answered this question, but you were talking about the U.S. Forest Service grading system on the ground. As were your results fairly comparable when you took those trees to the mill? Because I know that grading system can be somewhat subjective, uh, but did you see similar results when you got those boards to the mill and got them cut up as far as their grading system goes? Yeah, I mean, the force, the U.S. Forest Service tree grade system is really set up. I mean, that was developed with um, the end product in mind, so they match pretty well. I think where the tree grade system fails and a lot of people who do a lot of this grading understand this um, is the top end. A, a grade one tree in the U.S. Forest Service grade, tree grade system could be anywhere from a number two saw log up to a, a prime veneer log. Um, they'll all grade out at the U.S. Forest Service grade one. So my unfortunately, all my estimates really can't capture that highest quality material um, well. Uh, and for that reason, we're doing some tracking of of those highest grade trees after repeated prescribed fire on the hardwood ecosystem experiment. So that's a study in progress. So we have a question in the chat. 
um, from Ken, has there been any study to determine if the reduced competition in the mid story due to RX fire may stimulate higher production of the standing oak timber? There. I know I've seen some work. I've, I've read a few studies where like the removal of an invasive component through prescribed fire helps. Um, but I haven't seen. I haven't seen anything definitive and probably it's probably because I haven't seen it. Uh, it's probably out there. Um, I don't think it's been of what I know of the system. I don't think it would be a strong impact. Um, but I, again, it's probably something that needs to be further studied. All right, we have a question in the room. Yeah, Matt Durstein from the South Zone of the Cherokee National Forest. Uh, wondering about the fire return interval that you used for your study. Yeah, we just basically, we, we looked at, um, we basically used whatever the forest service. This was basically investigating what manage, managers had been doing. And we just then classified it on based on what we saw in the data in terms of where it seemed like there was breaks in the data. Um, the four to seven years seemed to be where we started to see that bounce back of Maple Beach. Um, probably on a more xeric site, you could probably get away with a little bit longer return interval. On a more music site, it would be at the lower end. You'd want to get back fairly, fairly rapidly. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Mike. I, I, that, that was the only that's the only way I, I it's not a continuous study. It was just more of a class classes. Any other questions for Mike? All right, well, let's give Mike a hand. Thank you so much for uh, presenting to us. We really appreciate the work that you're doing um, for civil culture and also prescribed fire. So thank you so much, Mike. Thanks. You have a great day. You too. Next up, we have Craig Harper. Uh, Craig Harper is a professor and extension wildlife specialist for the School of Natural Resources for the University of Tennessee. He's going to talk to us today about oak pine woodland restoration. Let me pull up your PowerPoint. Get it going here for you. Uh, there should be the top button. You can test. Hello, hello. There you go. Let me get your PowerPoint going. Should be good to go. All right, are we good? Thank you, Jackie. As uh, Jackie mentioned, my name is Craig Harper with the University of Tennessee. I'm an extension wildlife specialist. I recognize many faces out there. A few of you I don't believe I've met yet, but uh, I've been a part of the Tennessee Prescribed Fire Council since we founded it, and I'm actually not remembering the year right now. Do you know that right off? What, Robin, was it 12? Yeah, so a long time, and as uh as uh, Robin said, it's good to be back in person instead of looking at each other through a computer screen. But I will switch gears a little bit from what uh, the previous speaker spoke about with regard to tree quality, but uh, talk about restoration of oak and pine savannas and implications for wildlife. And this is something that we've worked on in various aspects across a lot of different sites in Tennessee and some other places as well and it's been a lot of fun and exciting and, and interesting work that we've done and I'm not going to share with you the results of a study but more talk to you about in terms of what we've seen over a number of sites and provide some data from specific studies but have a little bit more of a of a holistic view and hope that maybe some of this will stimulate some discussion when we have roundtable discussion after a while. First off, let's 
think for a minute about what a woodland is. Uh, of course, I think terminology is important and it can cause some confusion as we colloquially talk about our woods, forest. We use the term woodland oftentimes fairly loosely, but there's diagrams through the ecological literature that you can see that kind of characterizes going from uh, prairie or grassland systems through savanna, woodland, and then the forest. And in general, with a woodland, we're talking about an area that has somewhere between 30 to 70 percent sunlight entering the, uh, the, can the tree canopy, but with the caveat that it has an understory that is largely dominated by herbaceous species. Otherwise, if we just have a bunch of tree seedlings and saplings uh, re-sprouting and coming up, we're essentially looking at a thin forest. And so if we look at some pictures going through this uh, diagram, if you will, we can see how the structure of the vegetation changes dramatically. And with regard to wildlife, along with this, the species that you find in these different systems and vegetation types differ dramatically. In fact, I think when you look through the literature, you can see that species occupancy, that means which wildlife species are occurring at different sites, probably is driven and determined more by the structure of the vegetation than anything else. And I'll talk about structure a fair amount through here, but keep in mind when I use that word structure, I'm talking about the density and the height of vegetation. So <clears throat> we all know what a typical grassland looks like. This is at uh, uh, AEDC and lots of extensive open areas there dominated by grasses, most of which are, are naturally occurring native warm season grasses here with a, a scattering of forbs uh, within. And when we add some trees, this is at Bridgestone Firestone, we see that we are beginning to get into what we typically call a savanna structure. So this is more what you would uh, characterize as a developing pine savanna with uh, some hardwoods coming in as well. If we add some more trees, this is at Foothills, WMA and, and Blunt County with uh, shortleaf pine and the restoration efforts that's been going on there. This would be characterized more of, of a pine woodland because of the amount of trees that are on the site. And of course, the site here was dominated, a good mixture, but uh, largely dominated by herbaceous species. We also can see that same structure in a hardwood dominated system. So this would be representative of an oak woodland dominated by, by oak and, and hickory with the amount of trees here and the amount of sunlight coming in, we would characterize that still as a woodland. And here you see the mid-story is, is pretty evenly mixed between herbaceous and woody, but with continued disturbance, especially through fire, we can see a preponderance of herbaceous species persisting and maintaining in the understory. When we add more trees or when we allow less sunlight, and in this case, this is a hardwood stand that has been treated by selectively killing or removing various individuals. And here we're looking at about 30% sunlight coming in. And when you see a, a lesser amount of sunlight coming in, you see a reduction in the rapidness of the growth coming up from the understory and, and a midstory developing. And then, of course, we've all seen this as we go into stands where there's only uh, typically two to four percent sunlight coming in, a closed canopy stand, and oftentimes the uh, understory is largely non existent, as you see here. And you can see through these woods two to three hundred yards. Well, <clears throat> when we look at this structure right here, think about the wildlife. And so what species would you expect to find in such a situation? There are lots, and I'll go through several pictures of this. These are fairly common species, but these are species that such a structure enables them to persist. They're adapted to that, and they do well in that type of environment. If we go to one of those stands that's allowing approximately 20 to 30, maybe 40% sunlight, and you see this type of growth coming in in the understory, you will see a shift 
and species occupancy. Now, some of those other species that I just showed you in the closed canopy stand, of course, may be present in a stand such as this, but when we have better development of the understory and of the midstory, that's when we start picking up additional species. And you see other species such as white-tailed deer that I have here, of course, that's a classic generalist. It could be found, is found in, in any of these vegetation communities, but, and I will get to this a little bit later, when this type of structure is present and available on the landscape where uh, this species occurs and, and others such as wild turkeys and different vegetation types, then we often see more robust populations because we see more opportunities for, for feeding and cover during different times of the year for different uh, portions of their life cycle. So although a generalist species might be found in all of these, having some different structure and vegetation types can be advantageous for the species and for, for management. Now, if we see a lack of disturbance with an increase of sunlight such as this, and this is something that, that Mike alluded to uh, in the last presentation, we're, we're looking at you know three to four years without additional disturbance, with this amount of sunlight, which is around 50%, we see that increased growth and development of, of uh, tree seedlings into saplings and going into a midstory. We then see a different suite of species responding because they enjoy and actually require more of this dense, uh, uh, higher stem density than where you have less sunlight or more frequent disturbance. So how do we manage this? We oftentimes go in and remove or kill trees to allow additional sunlight into the stand, and then we implement disturbance. So we're influencing the structure with light availability, but also with our disturbance regime. And our disturbance regime is how we are going to influence and maintain that over time. So this is a two-aged oak hickory stand dominated by oak from which an irregular shelter wood or shelter wood with reserves has been implemented. And so if we're talking about a shelter wood with reserves, that means that we're going to retain this overstory after the other trees have been removed through the life of the stand that is now regenerating. And so with that amount of light, and here we're looking at uh, roughly 50% sunlight coming into the stand, the response can be very quick. And with this response, of course, we see a response by different wildlife species, different species that are using this for different life requirements. Some may be using this for nesting, some for foraging, some for soft mast, also for hard mast, depending on the tree species that were left, et cetera. But we can see considerable species diversity with regard to wildlife and, and plants in such, a, uh, such an environment. Now, if we want to maintain that, that's where we have to implement our disturbance. And here's what I'm getting to with regard to our restoration efforts with regard to restoring a woodland condition. So if we insert fire at this point, now we, be we can begin to maintain this condition over time, such as you see here in this picture. So where we start is dependent on the site, the ownership, objectives, the stand composition and quality. Of course, you can have many of these uh, trees harvested. Of course, there's lots of caveats with harvesting with regard to what trees are available and their quality, the, uh, the logging and what disruption that can provide with regard to skitter trails and dragging logs around the bud of the trees that you're trying to retain. So lots of issues there. And I, this, I can't be all encompassing with regard to every possible scenario here with the amount of time that we have. But what I want to concentrate on is more towards managing specific stands for a specific objective related to wildlife. And this may be from a public land agency perspective, as well as a private landowner's uh, perspective where these stands oftentimes may be smaller. And so a five acre stand can be managed just like a hundred acre stand can. And regarding which species you are trying to identify, your area or scope of management then would vary because different wildlife species have different area requirements. 
So all of these cuts, all of these burns, et cetera, don't have to be of a particular size, but with the increase or decrease in size, that can be highly influential on habitat quality uh, for di different species as well as occupancy. In general, I like to uh, get managers and, and landowners to think about the site. And in general, a drier site, obviously, is more predisposed for burning than a moisture site. And obviously, you're in general seeing tree species there that are more tolerant of fire than on moisture sites. So this isn't revelation that's uh, well established in the literature, but a lot of times we don't necessarily think of adjust, adjusting our management, thinking about the aspect and, and site. Of course, as I mentioned, the trees can be harvested. If the trees will pay their way out of the woods and if that is of the landowner's objective, but a lot of times landowners don't care to have the trees harvested, don't want them harvested, don't want the, uh, the, the scarring, if you will, on the sites from uh, skitter trails and the logging operation and the log decks don't want to take the risk because the stand might be relatively small with regard to damaging the residual uh, species. And of course, as I mentioned, a lot of times in those types of stands, the tree, the trees wouldn't have enough value to it to attract a logger anyway. And in those situations, we can go in and selectively kill the trees that we don't want and leave the ones that we do want based on any number of factors, but of course, having to do with uh, the tree species, the quality of, of the individual and the landowner's objective. And so we commonly will go in and treat species, tr treat trees that uh, we, we don't want in the stand by girdling and spraying an herbicide solution that you see here. And keep in mind, I think this is an important that at least in my opinion, this is a process. It's not an event. As long as the sun shines and the rain continues to fall, plants are going to continue to grow. And so it's not something that you're going to do one time. Now, with regard to oak regeneration, there might be an event or two that you implement to get advanced regeneration on the ground. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about managing a stand. I'm talking about managing an area for different wildlife species. And so... I have found over the years of doing this that starting somewhat small with regard to the number and amount of trees that you take out generally is a good thing. And then work and continue at that as time goes on. You can always go back in and, and revisit a stand and take out more trees if needed. If you don't want the tree to re-sprout, and it would be difficult for me to overstate the importance of this. When you're trying to restore a woodland, what is the number one thing that you're fighting? Tree sprouts. You're really trying to get more of that herbaceous composition. The root systems of these trees are enormous with regard to what they're competing with, and those sprouting tree uh, stump sprouts will always win against competing herbaceous species. And it takes many, many fires. Forget about four, five, six fires. Think 15, 18, 25 fires before you start beating the carbohydrate reserves in, the, in these root systems. So treating these stumps with an herbicide application such as this around the cambium layer to prevent the re-sprouting, I think is critical with regard to getting where you want to go in many of your objectives rather than letting all of them re-sprout. This is relatively cheap, and if you just have somebody to do it, it's done. It's an added step, but it's not difficult, and it makes a huge difference. This technique, if you will, is very selective. With that herbicide mixture I showed you, you can even treat a stem of a double stem tree, whether that be uh, yellow poplar, whether that be white oak, whether that be whatever, and kill the one stem and allow the other one to continue living. If it's a double trunk tree that you're wanting to get rid of, such as this sweet gum, you can treat it with the girdle below the split and thus kill the entire uh, tree. So it works very well. And this is the effect that you see 
not immediately, but it will take this application typically four to six months before the tree is dead. It can be done at any time of year. The only difference is with the maples and the ones that really have a high sap flow in late winter, early spring. Obviously, that's not a good time because when you girdle it, the water literally is running out of it. And so we see dead standing trees that are so important for so many wildlife species. I would argue that there's probably not one feature in the woods that would contribute to increased wildlife species diversity than dead wood. Both standing and down dead wood is very, very important for a number of uh, tree species, uh, wildlife species. And I always try to get that across to, to landowners that I'm working with. For the trees that you leave, we have documented an average of 25% crown increase in just the first year. Now that's not gonna happen every year from there on out, but that's fast. I mean, that's significant to get that much crown increase. And with a crown increase, of course, that means among that individual tree, you can have more mass production because the crown is larger. In fact, we've documented on average in a 65% increase in crown production of oaks whose crowns were released entirely all the way around. And keep in mind, we've uh, documented how approximately 40% of the trees, the individual oak trees, and this is of white oaks, produced 70% of the acres. And there will be a few of them that actually increase in acorn production class like from poor to good to moderate, uh, poor to moderate to good to excellent, not that many, but a few. But before that occurs, only 30% of the trees are producing 70 to 75% of the acres. And so what that means is you literally can go into a solid stand of oaks, kill half of the oak trees or more, and increase your acorn production. And so getting that across to landowners is very important when they realize this is like one of the only cases that you literally can have your cake and eat it too with regard to mass production from the trees and forage production from the understory, soft mass, et, et cetera. So what do we retain? Uh, of course, those spe species that are relatively fire tolerant and of relatively high wildlife value and then keep in mind, all of these are not what we would call fire tolerant, but certainly they can have value to different wildlife species. And this is going to be, I think, I hope, one of my most important messages is whether these species live in the stand or not is dependent on your fire intensity. And that's one thing I'm glad Mike mentioned there towards the end of his presentation. And, and I'll show you some more pictures here in a second. But your fire intensity is absolutely critical. You can retain these species in a stand that is burned if you're not burning, if you are burning with very low intensity. Ones that you want to get rid of. Now, I'm not a tree hater of any species. Every one of these species will provide a little something here or there for some wildlife species. But in general, these are the ones that we typically are selecting against and selecting for that uh, those that I showed in, in the previous slide. So can you burn hardwood? I would hope that after 11 years of the Tennessee Prescribed Fire Council and the many, many field days that we've all been associated with and the work that we've done and the research, we don't really have to have this slide, but I included it anyway to say yes, we can burn in, in hardwoods uh, that has been demonstrated time and time and time again, uh, whether that be in the late growing season, in the dormant season, uh, early growing season, in the mid growing season at any time. And we'll get a little more into that in a minute. And Mike also mentioned this that I was so glad to see also. Not only the intensity, but the debris left at the bottom of the trees. When you have debris such as this, you're essentially setting a campfire at the bottom of the tree. And so, you know, shazam, uh, we, we have a wound here. Of course we do. 
And so I think something that's very important, you know, I've told people before, I, I really enjoy walking around in the woods and, and looking at my trees and carrying a little chainsaw or whatever with me. And so do that. You know, when you put in your fire breaks and you're preparing for your burn, walk through the stand. Inventory the trees. These are the ones that are important to me. And if there's debris there, move it out of the way. So I realize with state agencies who are trying to burn literally 500 acres at one time, that's not going to be possible. I also have lots of questions and issues about burning 500 acres at one time that maybe we can get into with the roundtable discussion. Not that that's never, uh, never should be done, but in a lot of objectives and instances that shouldn't be done. But walk through the woods and check out what you have. This is critical with regard to retaining these trees and, and not having that wounding and damage that, that Mike was uh, referring to earlier. So how do you do this? And I'm talking about when I'm visiting with, with private landowners, I think, get, try to get them to think small. You don't have to burn all of your woods. Rarely should you. Uh, there are specific sites, obviously, that are more suitable than others. And I tell them, if you're not comfortable with fire, you know, use a, a backpack blower, blow out a section a quarter of the size of this room. Start with something small. Get, get a little experience. Have experienced people come in and help you. You know, learn something about fire before you go out and start trying to implement, implement it. And I'm not going to get into a, a fire safety discussion here, but I think that should go without saying. Of course, uh, a certain amount of experience is, is very important, but starting small, having experienced people to help you, using low intensity fire. And because I'm talking about oak woodland restoration, and even pine woodland restoration, having relatively low intensity fire is important. And I'll get more onto that here in just a second. And also to adjust and alter your timing of burning. Who in here has burned woods intentionally in July or August? How difficult is that? Real. If you don't have a minimum of 30 and really about 50% sunlight coming into those woods, unless we're in drought conditions in Tennessee where we get 50 plus inches of rain a year, you're not going to burn the woods in. What, what is the month of the least wildfire incidents? Robin, do you know right off? It's got to be June, July, August. There's a reason for that. Everything's wet. Those leaves have 80 to 90% water. That's what the green is, the chlorophyll. And so getting people to do more burning for wildlife objectives at that time of year, not arguably, but demonstrably easily is the safest time of year to do that without risk of it getting out. And so when do most people burn? February, March, early April. Full intensity of sunlight coming into the site, full energy. That's the most volatile of all conditions on, on average. So thinking outside the box and looking into growing season, and I'm not talking about the last week of April, you know, when, you know, the leaves have gotten to the size of the mouse's ear and you have no differential effect than if you burn three weeks earlier, but into the growing season, that can have a very differential effect with regard to uh, some of the composition and the effects on wildlife. And so a lot of people make fun of me with my little piddly fires, but Take a look at this. What are we doing here? We're consuming the leaf litter and those small regenerating stems, every one of them, at least the vast majority of them, are top killed. And according to when we burn, we can influence the percentage of those that are top killed, at least a little bit perhaps, and, and Mark's going to provide more in-depth information on, on that later. Expect a majority of the... Uh, uh, tree stems to re-sprout regardless of what time you burn, but moving that into the growing season certainly can have an effect. So here is a north facing slope, oak, hickory, and yellow poplar burn six times in 13 years. And so if you're looking, for example, or talking to someone who is interested in turkey hunting and they want to 
set areas on their property where turkeys are going to roost and have a designated roost site and improve brooding cover, for example. There you go. So you can have that even on some of these more mesic sites with very frequent fire. If you want to take a bigger chance of damaging trees, burn like this. Now, that's one case where, in general, no, I don't want to burn with three to uh, with two to three foot flame lengths. Uh, you will have a higher incidence of scarring with that type of intensity than with literally four to eight inch flame lengths. So burning with less intensity, using back and fire, flank and fire, which are less intensive firing techniques. Sometimes, of course, you need heading fire to get the fire uh, to move through, but, but think of using more less intensive uh, burning and burning slower, allowing the fire to kind of do its time, uh, do its thing, especially with this lower intensity fire. And, and I, I know we get out there and we're burning. Oh, good night. It's, it's three o'clock. We better hurry up and get this thing wrapped up. Now, how, how often does that happen? It happens all the time. And what you do then is, is use more heading fire, and then you will have a higher preponderance of, of wounding of the trees that you'd rather not. Again, burning at different times of the year. Here, we're just letting a small backing fire go through and check out the time of year. Here we are in October. And what that results is a happy burn crew. We're not all, you know, blackened up with soot where we've been fighting the fire the whole time. We're actually relaxed and smiling and ready to go home and eat supper. It's all good. And look at the effect that we had on the overstory trees. It's tremendous. And work has been done, done showing that every day is a potential burn day according to your objectives. And so I know we all know that and we, we, we say that, but I think it's important to try to put more of that in, into practice. So the fire frequency is what's determining the structure along with the intensity. Of course, a more intensive fire, you could kill every tree out there, you know, according to, you know, if you're really burning it super hot. But if you're having mid-story stems that are getting into that two, three, and four inch diameter uh, range, you're going to have to increase the intensity more to kill those or over time, as you burn on a fairly frequent basis, you're going to see more of those drop out. Or as Mike indicated earlier, in which I really, really like, using some mid-story removal technique where you go through with a chainsaw or maybe somebody wants to use a hatchet or a machete and, uh, you know, kill the trees with girdling spray or hack and squirt. But I really prefer using a small chainsaw because with wildlife, there are some trees that I want to cut down and sprout. There are some trees that I want to make sure that uh, I get that sprouting because of the increased browse value for deer or increased structure uh, for nesting of, of different species. So here's we're looking at a two-year fire return interval there and, and how that may be beneficial for several different species. If we increase that to four years, this is more often than not the typical structure that we see. This is neither good nor bad. It's just according to your objectives. And for these species here, that's very good with regard to the structure that they require for, for nesting. And then if you extend that to eight years, and uh, I find this very interesting. If you look at just about any data set throughout the Eastern US, you will find that it's somewhere in that six to eight year time period where the understory has dropped out. You've got canopy closed from the regenerating stems and that's where the whole dynamic changes and and I, th I thought that was also very interesting from uh from what mike was saying about the the composition of more mesic species really beginning to to increase after about seven years also but in this case there are other species that really enjoy and require more stem density and a taller uh stems than than some of the other species so of the benefits. I always try to turn this to uh, some game species, obviously deer and turkeys. In the Eastern US, more licenses are sold, more dollars are spent, more acres are managed for white-tailed deer than all other species combined. That includes turkeys. 
easily includes Bob White, easily includes every non-game species. So think about that. What do private landowners in Tennessee manage their property for more than anything else who have a wildlife interest? In, interest deer and turkeys, which happens to be two generalist species. They don't have to have an oak woodland. They don't have to have a certain uh, stem density or structure to be present, but by having some of that around, you can facilitate better management for those species. And what we've noticed and documented in Tennessee, for example, when hens have some of this structure, especially that provides overhead cover of the nest, their nest success increases. Also, of the turkey study that we're implementing, we're in the seventh year right now in South Middle Tennessee, only 7% of the landscape in the five counties that we are working in are in what we would call early succession. 46% of the turkey nest are located in early succession, showing how they are seeking out these vegetation types for different life requirements, in this case, obviously, nesting. With white-tailed deer, lots of studies looking at the amount of forage that are in woodlands and savannas, for example, what is present there and how that compares to closed canopy forest and the effect on the amount of nutrition for deer. This is huge for landowners. And think of the non-game species. They're not managing specifically for non-game birds. They're not managing specifically for pollinators. But by getting them to adjust their management to better manage for deer or turkeys, they're managing for those non-game species by default, and they don't even know it. I would argue that deer hunters could do more for pollinators than every pollinator enthusiast across the state if they learn the benefits of providing early successional vegetation, whether that's in an old field community or whether that's in a savanna, and including that community that will persist in an oak woodland, especially when you have anywhere from about 50 to 70 percent sunlight coming in, it's, it's, it's tremendous. And, and I think we can move the needle by using these generalist species that are, uh, that are of such high interest among landowners. Uh, Mark Turner, who's uh, working on his PhD, he created this graph right here showing how when we implement management practices that increase body weights, and this is over, I think it's 26 states across the eastern U.S., where we've monitored deer populations on these various properties. As adult doe weights go up, it is strongly correlated with mature buck growth score. There is no deer hunter that is not interested in antlers. And so when we can show them, if you manage your property this way and you get greater weights on your deer, that also means bigger antlers, that's what draws their attention. So we can manage for butterflies through deer antlers. And then Marcus Lashley and uh, Rainer Nichols at Mississippi State, they provided this showing the number of feeding photos of deer after burning in March, going up here, and this is without fire, as opposed to burning in, excuse me, this is with no fire, burning in March, how then the vegetation is, is set back a little bit, and here's the number of deer uh, feeding photos, and then burning in June, how the feeding photos are spiking. And this simply is following the regenerating vegetation. That regenerating vegetation is, is, young, palatable, highly digestible, and the nutrient content follows. And so you can have higher nutrition available throughout the summer by burning sequentially at different times through the, through the year. And here is just a look at uh, the nutrient quality. Here's crude protein and phosphorus showing with following fire in June, how you see elevated amounts of crude protein elevated amounts of phosphorus in the plants that, that deer are eating. So all of this is, is tying together. Andy Vanderjot in his study at uh, Catoosa showed that uh, restoration of oak woodlands and savannas negatively affected only three of 41 analyzed bird species 
hooded and worm-eating warbler, as well as other oven bird, but all others remain constant or increased. So this is significant. And I've shown pictures of, of uh, Kiker and, and Foothills before, but some of the folks in, in this audience may not have seen this. But here, Bill Smith has uh, cleared or thinned 96 acres on a 550-acre refuge specifically for Bob White. But you see the effect here in the dormant season and how this has also increased populations of other species or occurrence of other species, including woodcock. But then with regard to bobwhite, by doing this has maintained a bird for per two to four acres fluctuating by, by years over the past several years. That's significant and we've got a graduate student now who has continued to uh, look at quail use of the area. And if we take a look at where the locations are, you can see a predominance of the locations on, on Kiker is in this whole area back up in here that has been thinned and, and burned frequently, showing that this oak woodland restoration, and this is uh, at, at a tree canopy level of 30 to 40 percent. And other research has shown that once you get up into about the 50 percent range, you you may see occupancy by Bob White, but you're not you shouldn't expect to see any population increase. We're really talking about thinning the trees down where you have absolutely no more than 30 to 40 percent uh, canopy coverage. And then finally, at uh, at Foothills, some of you may not have have seen these data, but this is really neat. Once Bill and and others begin to uh, undergo shortly pine restoration on the site and they thinned 800 of 6,800 acres on, on the WMA. And this was done from 2017 through 2020. If you look at the harvest of big game for three years prior to this, and then the three years following the management not only do you see increases in non-game species such as red-headed woodpeckers and, and brown-headed nuthatch, but also harvest of deer up 250%, turkeys up 445%, and the bear harvest up 680%, all obviously responding to this increase of food value and cover value and attracting them to, the, to these areas and helping their populations to increase. How are we doing on time, Jackie? All right, seven, seven more minutes. What? Okay. I didn't know if we'd have time for this, but I, I will walk you quickly through a little case study. <clears throat> and this is at Camp Tanasi. It's a, a Girl Scout camp in, in Union County where we've worked since uh, 2000, I believe it is. But in 2002 and three, uh, many of you who were working around here then know that the we had a, a huge epidemic of pine beetles. And in this one stand, which is around uh, 25 acres or so uh, there in, in, on, the, on the camp, this was the scene in April of 2006. That's when I took this picture. And you can see many of the, the dead pines still standing and all the debris on the ground where a lot of them had, had fallen over in, in the uh, previous three years. And so we decided, okay, let's start an oak woodland restoration effort here. Let's take out some more of these trees, the ones that we don't want, leave the ones that we do want, and let's start burning and let's watch how this develops over time. So here we are, and, and let me back up. We burned the site in April of 2004 for the very first time. And this picture was taken in 06. And so here we are, we burned it again in April of 07. You can see the structure and all the down material. We burned it uh, again in September of 08, and this was the first late growing season fire on this site. Here's the, the stand in, in August of 2010. We burned it again with late growing season fire in September of 2011. By July of 2012, you see what it's looking like, and there's a 1,400 pounds uh, per acre dry weight of selected deer forage. Keep that in mind, and we'll bring that back here in just a minute. We burned it again in April, uh, actually a dormant season fire of 2013. 
Here's the picture of the stand in, in June of 2013. And the graduate students and technicians, they go in and collect vegetation measurements in the stand each year to track uh, composition and, and structure. So you can see here after two April fires, tree sprouts, tree cover in the understory represented roughly 50% of the understory coverage. Following one late growing season fire, we had reduced that to 34%, and the FORB went from 5% up to 25%. After the second September fire in September of 2011, here are the data collected in 2012. Now you see we're 19% uh, relative coverage of tree species in the understory, 26% uh, percent coverage of FORBs. We go back and we have another April fire here, and you see the relative even distribution of plant types on the site. Now, we continue on and we see these other species that we regard as woodland obligates come in. They're throughout the site, very interesting to see. We burned again during the dormant season of 2016, here it is in September of 2017. Structure is, is terrific for deer. By July of 2018, we're finding, of course, turkey nest in the site. And I want you to notice a couple of things. One, do you notice the dead trees? That's not from fire. That is from my chainsaw and squirt bottle that the technicians are, are walking around and spraying behind me. Again, this is a process. We didn't just do this at once. We did it over time. And we're continuing to use fire, as you see. The other thing is, do you see how this is kind of brushy and, and fairly open? That's fairly open there because in that area, we didn't like those trees. We killed them. If I turn around, not quite 180 degrees, this is what I see. You see more trees here. Four trees are here because we like those. We left them. We didn't kill them. I think this variable retention, having variation in the amount of sunlight coming through, is absolute critical to wildlife diversity and even for specific species, such as wild turkeys, where you may see broods using this type of structure right here because it's not so tall that the hens are covered covered up. It's about, you know, 18 inches to two, maybe three feet tall. The hens can see there's protection for the broods. And then there's some more brushy areas such as this, where you tend to see more of their nest uh, placed. And then in the understory, in the overstory, you're still seeing these bird species, which tend to use woodlands more or are found only in woodland areas. So there we have species in the understory, we have species in the overstory, all getting different things out of this area because of the variable retention that we implemented. We burned again in April of 2020, this time with an early growing season fire. And by August of 2020, now this site has been burned eight times since 2004 with low intensity fire, altering our season of burning, and now look at the percentage of tree cover in the understory versus the amount of forb cover. That is where we are pumping up the nutrition in a huge way for white-tailed deer. There's on average 1,200 pounds of deer forage per acre. And if we compare that with a food plot on the site, same season, and this is, this is a good food plot, a full Ladino clover that is uh, over 12 inches tall, 1,800 pounds per acre, and you compare that to the deer forage in, in the woodland and think of the cost per acre to plant and maintain the food plot versus periodically burning this stand. This, coincidentally, 48 trees per acre, 48% sunlight, 50 square feet of basal area, and if I go right back over here, about 250, maybe 300 yards, maybe not quite that much. This is what I'm going to walk into. At this site, this is, quote, control. We did no overstory treatment. We have not killed any trees on purpose in here. Whatever has fallen out has fallen out naturally. But you see a stand that is dominated 
by sugar maple and has a large percentage of American beech in the stand. Only a couple more slides here. 118 trees per acre, 128 uh, square feet of basal area, 3% sunlight, 40 pounds of deer forage. But again, we burned this six times since 2004 with low intensity fire, showing how this could be implemented without damaging the trees. And there's a picture of a back and fire coming down the hill. So in conclusion, these open woodlands, oak woodlands or, or pine woodlands or mixed open uh, oak and pine woodlands can provide habitat and resources for many different wildlife species. For those private landowners that are interested in the game species, excellent forage for deer, nesting and brooding areas for wild turkeys. However, frequent fire during varying seasons is essential using low intensity fire, concentrating on the appropriate site, those that are predisposed uh, to fire ecologically. And I, I believe the variable retention can be very important. And I was just there yesterday, and here's a, a picture of the site now that's uh, right at, well, 20 years later, and how we have transformed this, this dead pine stand and, and a few mixed oaks and hickories into a really nice uh, oak woodland that lots of species are, are enjoying. So if we have time, I'm happy to take any questions or facilitate discussion for after a while. Yeah, so we do have a, uh, some time. We do have a break scheduled now, but um, this was such a great presentation. Um, I do want to take the opportunity because I am, uh, I am the facilitator. So um, I did want to note, Copy that. Um, I did want to note that, first of all, thank you so much for bringing up fire effects and fire intensity. Um, I think it's important that as prescribed burn managers, certified prescribed burn managers, when we're talking about objectives, it's really important to think. And so specifically at the base of the of the trees you mentioned how you know and so as burn managers yeah we walk through our unit yeah we look at everything but where does the weight fall as far as making sure that those and this is just comments making sure that the base of the trees are um so this is just comments so then and then it, it covers right us as burn managers we talk about you know, burning in different seasons and flame links and fire effects and residence time. However, I do think for the Tennessee Prescribed Fire Council, we should also think about outreach. And, and because a lot of the times as a, as a practitioner, um, I get pushback from the cultural idea that the only burn to have is a scorching burn. So those are just my comments, but questions. Who has a question? I know there's one in the chat. Yeah, real quick. All right, so the question we have in the chat, um, how does the fire carry in the late growing season? Tennessee Division of Forestry tried a late growing season fire on my property last year and it wouldn't carry at all. Since then, I have been mechanically thinning and did a dormant season burn on part of the area that was probably too intense, but I'd like to switch to a late growing season or future burns, but I'm not sure there will be enough fuel. Yeah, um, she's, uh, or whoever that is, is, is asking about the spread of fire during the late growing season. And as I mentioned, in our experience, if you don't have a minimum of 30% sunlight into the stand or a considerable amount of wind, the fire is not likely to carry. And so you need more sunlight to have a little more energy coming into the stand, of course, at that time. And something that is very common is to see just a, a low smoldering fire and you're trying to have to try to get it lit here and there don't expect necessarily just to see a fire line and the fire moving slowly or quickly across the area expect to have to do some some spot firing throughout the the unit and and try to get as much litter consumed as possible and and also picking your day picking your day when the conditions will permit, and that includes some wind. Uh, some wind at that time is, is very 
very critical oftentimes to get the fire to move through, but expect it to be slower, uh, obviously, than during the dormant season. Uh, we have a question in the room. Jason? Yeah, um, maybe this is as a primer for later. We're going to kind of bounce around to the different agencies and talk about updates and stuff, but uh, kind of going back to your brief comment about burn unit size. I know as agencies, we feel a little bit of pressure to try and get as much burning as we can get done in a year. And then maybe a few years ago, we started to feel some pressure from like the pollinator folks to cut down on burn unit size. So we weren't scorching all the habitat. And then maybe I'm feeling a little bit of that on the wildlife side now in terms of redu reducing burn unit size. So could you maybe speak to that just a little bit as a, as a primer to go in into later? Yeah, with regard, I, I think scale of management is one of the most contemporary issues in, in wildlife management today. You know, how big of a scale should be would should we be managing on with regard to individual practices? You know, how much should we burn? How much should we cut? How much should we, you know, whatever? What's the acreage size? And and to answer your question, it just goes to your objectives. So in essence, I like to view our land management efforts in one or two broad categories. Either we're trying to manage for an ecosystem or we're trying to manage for focal species. Now, if you're trying to manage for an ecosystem, you're more concerned with species occupancy rather than just abundance of a species. And of course, there can be some differences with, with threatened and non-endangered uh, uh, species, and I, I think of threatened and endangered species, and I think of, you know, red-custated woodpecker in, uh, along the coastal plain and some longleaf areas. But in general, you're looking to maintain that ecosystem and let the species kind of fall in as they may. You're more mimicking a natural uh, historic disturbance regime rather than a, uh, a, a precise application. However, if I'm managing for a particular species, whether that be uh, deer or cerulean warbler or whatever the case may be, then I'm trying to guide my management and my practices and my scale according to the biology of that species. And I, th I think Bob White is an important one there, where we think about the average home range of a Bob White, and it requires so much disturbance. So how much of an area should we try to impact? Because we, we've got to disturb so much of the area to maintain uh, Bob White populations on an area. But I think going smaller such that you're not essentially destroying the whole annual home range of, of a bird during one disturbance event is important, but rather paring that down such that you're implementing disturbance based more on their daily movements and, and home range size rather than what you can just get done. That That's a question that requires you know a lot of discussion, but I think it goes back to your objective. You can't just say, oh, we shouldn't burn over 100 acres or, or we should only keep our burns to 10 acres. That, that's you know according, according to what the objectives are. We have another question in the room. Yeah, Dr. Harbour, could you, um, kind of going back to the earlier question about extended uh, late growing season fire, or mid-growing season fire. Could you talk a little bit more about needle casts and how, you know, that can be used to, you know, maybe facilitate fire later on in the year and also how that could be used from a management standpoint on the front end to, um, to inform or plan for the future, maybe deciding what trees you're leaving, that sort of thing. Yeah, and the needle cast can be more important for some species than others. Of course, if we're talking about loblolly, uh, and then to some extent, short leaf, which obviously has shorter leaves and, and may not have as much fuel, especially in a savanna or even a woodland setting from the from the needles. But we're seeing that right now at this time of year, and then later on, those needles are going to be falling, and that that fine fuel during midsummer certainly can help. Uh, impl implementation of fire at that time that obviously then can help you with regard to setting back hardwood encroachment, which is of course an issue in in many of these sites. So 
that's not speaking to the wildlife species. That's determined to which species you're trying to manage for in that particular area. But but yes, uh, we've also implemented fire in uh, a more intensive fire, and that obviously can get up and cause some browning of the needles that's going to fall later. So all of that kind of comes together, but it certainly can add to the amount of fuels in a mid to late growing season fire because of the casting of the pine needles at that time. Thank you so much, Dr. Harper, for talking to us today. Um, really appreciate all of the conversation and hope that during our breaks and networking and lunch and even afterwards, we continue talking about these topics because we all should be thinking about science-based practices, right? We all should be considering not just lighting it on fire, but going back to the, the science-based uh, reasons for how, uh, how we reach our objectives. I'd like to take a five minute break. I know that the lunch has arrived, which is really great planning. However, we have one last speaker before lunch who's gonna talk to us about um, uh, a practice, uh, prescribed fire practice and restoration um, down in the Chattanooga area. So take five minutes, try to get back here, and then we'll have Murray Giesling up next uh, to discuss Savage Gulf. Get you going 10 minutes if you want to. There you go. Where are you going? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, just to orient you, this is uh, the project area. You can see its proximity to Chattanooga and Nashville again on the southern portion of the Cumberland Plateau, uh, southern at least in Tennessee. A rather large project area, Savage Gulf is around 18,000 acres of uh, state natural, excuse me, state natural area. And it is the newest Tennessee State Park, although one of the oldest state natural areas celebrating its 50th anniversary uh, with its designation as a state natural area. Uh, you can see in this photo as well, some of the darker areas that's indicating uh, loblolly pine plantations. Uh, so a lot of logging up on top, 
of the plateau in, in this general area. Uh, 2014 began an acquisition of uh, neighboring Loblolly sites uh, to the natural area. Uh, logging company retained the logging rights for three to five years, but the state took ownership of the land. And we saw coming uh, an opportunity to do well some needed work uh, to uh, provide for a, an appropriate ecosystem type. area. This is the uh, trail map you would get at the ranger station. Should you visit Savage Gulf, um, it's no longer part of South Cumberland State Park, but it is its own, as I mentioned. Uh, so the land use now is primarily for recreation. Um, staff there is occupied with the front country aspects of, of running a state park and the trail maintenance aspects, um, providing for recreation, backcountry, camping, backpacking. There's about 50 miles of trails in the state park. All right, so it's also known for its large trees, which is one of the reasons it was set aside. Uh, within the what's called the Gulf, colloquially, it's a gorge. Within the several gorges that make up Savage Gulf, um, we've got some what was referred to at one time as virgin timber. We don't really use that term anymore, but old growth. And it's still how it still is home to uh, state champion um, chestnut and cucumber magnolia. And I believe this time next year we'll be able to say probably shortleaf pine champion as well. Uh, here you know, you'll see the older photo is. Uh, 1971 photo of Governor Winfield Dunn, uh, who signed the Natural Areas Act uh, later that year, uh, along with Dr. Elsie Quarterman and Kenny Dale of the National Park Service. Um, it's been described in its in its um, application for natural national landmark status, which it received as the best and largest virgin forest left in the mixed mesophytic region of the eastern deciduous forest by Dr. Catherine Kiever. But um, up on the plateau still exists some large shortleaf pine. And uh, the other photo is a federally threatened species, a white trenchless orchid or Platanthera integralibia. And uh, that drives a lot of what we do within natural areas program. Usually these natural areas are set aside for some rare plant species or rare ecosystem type. And in this case, Savage Gulf is dotted with uh, small populations of, of this plant. Okay, so this is generally what we were, what we inherited uh, with the acquisition of those loblolly plantations. Um, everybody knows the pines and lines model, and this is the habitat actually where we found our Plantanthera integralabia. It's a known population since the early 90s, uh, but this is what it was growing in. Uh, so boggy habitats uh, among sphagnum moss and and things. Uh, but when we look at what work is to be done at Savage, uh, we refer to our 
pine ranges here and where the arrow is, is is our project area so just barely within the short leaf only um, range for pines so we could consider the loblolly that we inherited there as an invasive species uh, and not appropriate for for a habitat in this area uh, so these blue dots well this is one of our project areas known as meadow creek and the blue dots indicate the platanthera occurrences you can see they're within the the pine and this photo 2007 and we'll do kind of a progression you can see here there's been some thinning uh, still though complete canopy cover as far as our threatened species habitat goes. This is 2010. And the, uh, the big harvest started in 2016. And this photo is from 2019, although this was pretty much the condition in 2017 as well. Uh, you can see it did remove habitat canopy cover, uh, one of those populations. The other one is somewhat affected. And so this is what we found in 2017 at our site when we went to do a population count. So you can imagine that really got our attention uh, in the Division of Natural Areas. Uh, we were worried about, you know, what effect this might have on the population. Uh, at that same time, though, while this was going on, we're, there was a development for this NIFWIF grant happening because uh, we knew we had coming, in some cases, or in some ways of thinking about it, a blank slate, but also a time bomb, right? There's nothing that um, there's nothing that's going to be waiting on us to come up with the right plan or to get our stuff together and, and get to work. Um, work really should have been, we've always been behind the ball. Uh, in terms of the time bomb aspect of uh, restoration, once you have a like a clear cut, uh, complete removal of a dominant species like that. So saw the storm coming, uh, as illustrated in this photo, and and began preparing. Right, so it started with a drafting. There we go. Okay, drafting uh, of a short leaf pine restoration prescription plan, and that was. Put together through with Panther Creek Forestry, one of our partners. That eventually led to, and uh, since we had limited resources at the time, our first action was to put a line around our Platanthera habitat and go ahead and, and burn that. What we didn't want to happen was um, was an uncontrolled um, succession. So. We did burn that seven acres, a small plot there. Uh, it, the restoration prescription plan led to a programmatic prescribed fire plan, initially authored by the Forest Stewards Guild, but revised with mainly by the Division of Forestry with some input by Division of Natural Areas. Uh, another, another photo of kind of the condition, what we were left with. Um, so your general logging slash, and you can see the row of lava lolly pine that remains, and these are streamside management zones. So they harvested everything they could outside streamside management zones. So, you know, of course, the idea with the best management practices in that regard is that you leave, you leave some intact vegetation for erosion control for habitat it's just not something you want to get in get in and muck around with with a skitter and stuff but the problem was that it was planted in loblolly pine <laughs> all the way up into uh, the water so um, leaving it intact didn't do us any good in fact it was a hindrance in that we now have this terrific seed source for loblolly pine so that had to be removed as well uh, this is, I think, a year after you can see the region beginning. Um, this is a general picture of what the area looked like. Just this green, hairy stuff growing up uh, that was threatening. Uh, again, uh, another year after or in a different area that 
took off a little bit quicker. And some more photos of the same. Um, pockets of shortleaf pine left standing, if not in the stream side management zone because of the slope. Um, I don't know, they just figured it, I guess it wasn't worth harvesting these trees. I had the trouble of, I don't know, getting in and getting their equipment down the slope or whatever, getting the trees up out of the slope. But for whatever reason, there remains pockets of loblolly. Okay, so that restoration plan ultimately ended up in defining these four major areas. Uh, so three of these are that old pine, pine plantation that we just saw photos of, and one of them was um, kind of a closed canopy, mature shortleaf pine um, forest, right? Not exclusively shortleaf pine anymore, but um, it had a, our elements that kind of led us to management implications for these other newer sites. I don't have a photo of the planting going on, but the first action was supposed to be a prescribed fire. That did not happen for um, a couple different reasons, but the first action ended up being a planting of about 96,000 seedlings. And again, that was Panther Creek Forestry, our partner doing that work. This is a photo of one of the seedlings after a fire. Uh, Jason Miller pulled one up to check, see what species this was. We looked for that J. Crook and determined that's what it was. And uh, anyway, photo of that. Uh, so this is the first fire uh, which Division of Forestry uh, led and, and heavily manned. Um, it was, this is Meadow Creek again, 500 acres, uh, the first fire of that scale for us on the plateau. Uh, so it went pretty well. And this is a photo of fire running through some of the loblolly that we're trying to get rid of. Uh, we had really good fire effects for most of the day in most of our areas, but uh, it's a real kind of variable area in terms of aspect, uh, terrain, uh, you know, elevation and fuel type. Some post monitoring, post fire monitoring work had a really good kill through some of these short lob lollies. Uh, you can see that better illustrated here. Uh, good kill, uh, but some remain. You know, the more vibrant green in, in there, those, those are going to make it. And the trees you see on in the distance, that's kind of the boundary, the old park boundary. Uh, where the hardwoods kind of begin. Another photo within the units uh, the following spring, see the sprouts of, from the top kill. And so I guess our next management action after the prescribed, first prescribed fire was to actually go through and, and lop off the surviving saplings and again, work contracted through Panther Creek Forestry that did a terrific job of nearly getting them all. Um, over 500 acres is quite a task. This is also what the planting of the shortleaf pine looked like. So this picture can serve for both of those. Um, I think the spacing was about 15, 12 or 15 meters apart on those 96,000. Next began timber stand improvements of our streamside management zones and the remaining loblolly stands. And uh, while that was going on, we were seeing some really good results um, or really good herbaceous results from our first fire. So yeah, there's June, 2021. Uh, so a lot of grasses, you can see, see pretty good diversity in this photo. Some butterfly milkweed, um, some heliophytic response from species. 
which is kind of what we're after, right? We're after the biodiversity of the appropriate uh, grassland species. Another biodiversity photo uh, right there in the middle is <clears throat> shortleaf pine kind of rebounding after a top kill fire. In addition to that, what a, um, in addition to that, there's World Loose Strife and uh, Harry Lesbediza. Um, there's Helianthus species and uh, looks like wild quinine. So anyway, just a photo representing the kind of diversity. This is a in this is a random shot. I didn't go out finding the the most diverse looking photograph. This is what I just pointed the camera down and took a photo when I found the shortly pine. Some more cool plant stuff that natural areas really likes to see. Um, uh, Baptisia tinctora, which is a host species for a, a threatened frosted elfin. Uh, and some liatris, some, some native thistle. And so back to our uh, wild white fringeless orchid. So this is the habitat for our main population there at Meadow Creek. And we saw a really nice, to say the least, really nice response uh, to both the fire and the canopy removal of loblolly. Uh, it provided an engaging opportunity for the friends group of the park to come out and assist with population counts. And you can see the, the numbers there. So for these 20 something years, we found every year about 200 flowering plants. Now, and that represented not an average, but the average of the good years, right? Um, so sometimes much less, sometimes just within, you know, a, a dozen or two. Uh, after the thinning, the removal of Loblolly and the fire, oh, well, well, after the thinning, we saw a rebound, uh, huge population growth, and that continued to grow through the fire. Uh, after the fire response, saw another significant growth in flowering plants. So I just can't keep going. It, this year it did bounce back down, I think to around 16 or 1700. I don't recall, but um, anyway, very pleased with results in terms of creating a, a suitable habitat for this threatened species. All right, so uh, to sum up the Meadow Creek project, it began with planting, uh, the prescribed fire was next, mechanical removal through just people with machetes lopping off the saplings that were still remaining, uh, timber stand improvement through removal of loblollies, and herbicide has been a constant throughout this process and uh, even before the process. Um, herbicide treatments along the roadside, along the skitter roads in particular, that's where we saw uh, the worst of the invasives and but the rest of the unit is actually pretty clean the two in bold prescribed fire and herbicide will continue to be cyclical parts of the management in this unit okay so moving to the west we'll talk i'm not going to talk about all these but um the hobbs unit so this is the mature mature loblolly closed canopy forest area um it's about a thousand acres divided into three subunits. And see, so we've got an aging mature forest with basically zero regeneration of shortleaf pine. And that's through the lack of fire mainly. And uh, to borrow the term, the maplefication of this area. Did our first fire in December of 2020. Uh, through this, again, with the help of Division of Forestry. Uh, this just shows some, of the, I mean, the size of the trees, really. This is post-fire. And I think this photo illustrates well the, the main issue. You can see uh, the maple kind of jumping up the canopy with the shortleaf pine, uh, closing it out for any sort of region possible. And I think the last prescribed fire council meeting I was at, there was a talk about Eastern box turtle and the fire effects, uh, fire survival. So this is a nod to that. And uh, that is a live Eastern box turtle, by the way. 
post fire. Uh, really like this photo. It shows what we were kind of set out trying to do. The first fire knocked, perhaps top killed this red maple. You see the sprouts. Uh, the second fire, I hope, really splintered it and and killed it for good. I like this photo. It shows our fire line slash access road. Uh, so everything to the left was in the fire unit and to the right would be our, our control. Um, so this is after the second fire. And so if we were to continue with prescribed fire, which we're going to do, but if that was our only tool, I mean, would we get where we want to go? Probably not. Maybe, maybe after a generation, a human generation worth of fires, but I think it's going to take a little bit more than that to, to achieve the results that we're going for in an open enough system that um, shortly pine can regenerate and take care of itself other than an occasional prescribed fire. And we've got, uh, you know, I mentioned there wouldn't be a lot of uh, data, a lot of numbers to show you, but uh, we're working on that. So maybe in two years, I, I can present some of that on behalf of the University of Alabama, who's conducting a study. Um, and it's really a, a structure composition study. They've got a plot out here uh, and basically spatially determining it's the species and location of every tree in this plot and over time what how it changes with our prescribed fire and other management efforts going on in our Hobbs unit of Savage Gulf. Uh, I'll jump back to the rare plants because that's what we're all about at Division of Natural Areas. Uh, in this old topo, you can see the kind of a bog represented here. And uh, within that bog, it looks like this. This was or is habitat for Platanthera as well. And in 1977, there was an observation of a flowering uh, white fringe orchid. We've checked ever since, um, maybe not every year, but um, every two years generally, and have found none. Again, kind of closed out maplefication, uh, but went back this year and through advances in our, our resources and technology, uh, able to take a sample of this Platanthera leaf, this vegetative plant, and Dr. Ed Schilling from UT Knoxville was able to DNA test this thing to determine it is Platanthera integralabia. So amazingly, after 43 years, we we're able to confirm uh, for sure the presence of white fringes orchid at this site. Again, it's within our management unit. So using prescribed fire and selective thinning, we'll be managing this habitat, opening it up and letting some more sunlight hit the ground. And uh, the uh, the selective thinning has already begun in with the method of uh, injecting selected trees to, to open up the thinning, injecting herbicide in this bog. So what's next for our our grant area as our grant kind of comes to a close uh, this year? Uh, fortunately, we're able to continue work um, being funded through a U.S. Fish and uh, Wildlife Service Ecological Services grant We'll expand our project area and add a few burn units as well. So we'll add some a little bit to the north, some more huge short leaf pine that's being choked to well, uh, extinction in the area. Um, similar kind of situation as in Hobbs. And we'll be able to connect two of our, our larger units. So this seems like a group that might like some photo plot photos uh, showing over time. So I'll give you some. I, not a whole lot of change visually right here over these two years. Maybe some lob lolly gone in the background there. But here you can see a stand that was removed. Uh, same thing here. 
I got I have those pictures reversed. Obviously, we didn't grow all that loblolly in two years. Uh, anyway, we've got a couple of photo plots set up, and over time, uh, I hope in the next two years or so, we'll see some short leaf saplings kind of poking up, making their presence known. There's this is a, a video. We don't have to do that. Um, so these are our partners. And this, again, is the view, sunrise view from Stone Door. I'd be happy to take any questions at this point. Yes, I would love to be able to express that in, in numbers. Um, at this point, it's just not high enough without a designated plot and going through and counting, which we just haven't done. Uh, without a plot work, it's it's not possible to really um, determine a survival rate yet. Uh, so you may have put together that we hadn't planned it in March. They had a, a full growing season before we ran a fire through it. And that was definitely a concern and not how we outlined this plan in the beginning. You know, we we're gonna clear off with the prescribed fire, then go back and plant. Things didn't work out early 2020. Um, COVID wasn't the only thing, but it just didn't work out. Um, so I'm interested in, in knowing that as well. I hope after this summer, we'll have enough short leaf pine that's popping up over the vegetation, to be able to visually count and get a rough estimate. Yeah. Yeah, as we kind of trounce through the area, we'll come across short leaf pine and it's just like we knew it would do. It's gonna do better in some areas than, other, and, than others. Uh, so we do find pockets where I just don't see any versus you know, here's one and 15 meters over here. There's another one. You know, we, we do find that it's um, what we hope is kind of naturally selecting the appropriate spots uh, to thrive. Uh, we weren't after, you know, this short leaf pine savanna covering the entire 500 acres. We knew that it probably was not naturally occurring that way to begin with, nor do we have the resources to make that happen and maintain it. Um, this is one project area over many. So uh, our, our hope was to, to better the habitat of the shortleaf pine woodland. And, you know, so we've got a savanna woodland forest combination. Yes. Uh, sure. So the prescription for thinning is yet to be written. Now, there has been some work done in the bog, in the Platanthera habitat area, and that was just selecting the largest red maple seed sources. Uh, that's basically all that uh, involved um, in using an in injection method to kill those standing. I anticipate the prescription for the thinning to include, a, you know, we'll, we'll come up with a plot and use the radius uh, related to the shortleaf pine, the mature shortleaf pine. So everything within say, you know, 20 meters mid story will be removed. Um, things like that within a 20 meter radius, something like that. We hope to have that written with this next grant and implementation process. All right, there'll be a mixed bag of management practices. Um, yeah, so it won't be putting all the mid story on the ground, um, but we plan to use both chainsaws, herbicide, and skid steer mulcher work. All right, thank you. Everybody, thank you to uh, Murray uh, for doing such a great example of a project that we've been working together on. 
One of the things that I really love about these projects that I hear about and can, part and can participate on is the interagency kind of like interintelligence that goes on when we talk about doing prescribed fire and restoration activities. Um, we had private industry with Panther Creek and Ben Myers. We had the Forest Stewardship Guild, TDF, SNA, um, state natural areas and state parks uh, involved in this. And so, um, as they mentioned, Wade and I had taken a plan that was written by the Forest Stewardship uh, Guild and adjusted that for the two burns that TDF was involved in. And so my hope with these meetings uh, going forward, and we can discuss this in the future, is that we talk about collaboration and cooperation because when we discuss restoration and doing prescribed fire, we need to discuss more on, on doing it together, using all the tools, all the science, all the experience and skills and abilities together uh, to move this forward into the future, which is on a national basis, the goal for forest management on a landscape scale. So now is the time to take a lunch break. So those of you in the virtual realm, you're more than welcome to take a lunch break. We plan on coming back today um, at 11, or sorry, uh, one o'clock uh, central. Those of you on Eastern time, that'll be two o'clock Eastern time. During this lunch break, um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I will also check the chat. Um, if you need anything. Those of you who are in-house, we will be having lunch. It is catered. Um, if you will, turned off the wrong button there. If you will enter through here and walk around this way, um, that will be better for everyone because that's how the food is laid out. It is Moe's catering. There's an option of chicken or steak. Um, those of you who don't want chicken or steak, there's still uh, black beans, rice, uh, lettuce, tomatoes, all that, of that other stuff. There are drinks with ice. Uh, and cookies for dessert. Um, so I, I did order a little extra so that we could all share and have a great time. Use this opportunity to network. Use this opportunity to say hi to the other uh, prescribed burn enthusiasts in the room. All right, we will uh, come back at one o'clock. Uh, enjoy your lunch, everyone. <laughs>